everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. I'm Brian McLean, and I'm here with Demetrius Madrigal. Well, we had a pretty crazy week last week with the Oscars and all, and we have a lot to talk about today and a few other really interesting topics as well. So, D, good morning. You want to talk about the Oscars for a minute? Uh, I'm, I, we, I feel like we should. Uh, it's very much related to experience. There's a lot of experiential stuff that happened here. Um, I know that everybody and their mother has talked about it now. Um, and it's like kind of ready to move on, but maybe, maybe this conversation can just be like closure for us. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, and I think pretty much everyone knows at this point, there was an incident that occurred at the Oscars, uh, where Will Smith walked up to Chris Rock after he delivered a joke about his wife, Jada, and he slapped him live on stage, then went back to his seat, started yelling, don't talk, put my wife's name in your mouth and some swear words. And then sadly, nothing really happened. And the event continued to unfold. And he won an Oscar, and then attended parties. And everybody watched around the world. And it was a very creepy, unfortunate, sad moment. And Dee and I are going to just spend a few minutes talking about it and then talk about a couple of other things that uh, were pretty amazing that actually happened at the Oscars this year. So Dee, what is your overall take about what happened? And then also, how does this like in the long term, we always talk about brands and experiences and stuff. How do you think this changes how the average person who watches the Oscars is going to perceive it in the future? Well, I, I think in the moment, um, one of the issues with this is that it just puts everybody into a negative headspace. Like, it, yep. I mean, the reality is the slap didn't do, I mean, Chris Rock wasn't physically hurt. So to that extent, it, it, to, in, a, in a certain sense, sense, it's like, it, it, like, it's not like Will Smith needs to go to jail or something like that. I, I know a lot of people are calling for that, but I don't, I think that's, that's a little, little too much for something like that, like a pretty ineffectual slap. Um, but it's just puts everybody into like, all right, well, it reminds a lot of people about abuse that's going on. Cause these are the kinds of things that happen in abusive relationships. You see people lash out and it reminds people of like abuse growing up or it reminds people of like, okay, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith has health issues. Um, all these kinds of things like volatile relationships. And then also just the, the, the privilege that's provided and the kowtowing to wealthy, famous people. And then like, there's also like, was this, this, was this dishonest? Was this a, you know, was this a work or a shoot in professional, professional wrestling? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is this a bit? Is this staged? Like the for Chris Rock or uh, for Will Smith to get up and give that kind of self-aggrandizing, like uh, kind of gross speech about how he protected anything other than his own ego was just like in poor taste. It was like the the Academy Awards. the The Academy handled it very poorly. Everybody handled it very poorly. Um, Chris Rock uh, probably handled it the best out of a whole bunch of poor handling of it by not lashing out, not responding. Um, he didn't. He didn't even say any one of the fifty thousand comebacks that I'm sure ran through his head. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't hit Will Smith back, which you and I were talking about how difficult that can be when you've been disrespected like that and physically attacked and not respond physically. Um, that takes a lot of restraint, but at the same time, the joke was bad. I mean, aside from it being offensive and I think it was fairly, it was offensive, but it was in the grand scheme of things for rather mildly offensive. Um, and I, you know, have dealt with alopecia in my life. Uh, it was just a really bad joke, but it, I think everybody who watched it just came away with a really bad taste in their mouth. They thought of terrible things They they weren't paying attention to the rest of what was going on in the telecast. A lot of stuff got over overshadowed. I think Questlove got horribly disrespected. I think a lot of stuff happened there. That kind of behavior, just super inappropriate. It, stuff should not happen anywhere, let alone on the national stage for one of the biggest nights for so many filmmakers um, and so many people that, that just bust their ass every single day to try to make 
these things that we love to watch, these shows. And this is where they celebrate the ones that that people have voted to be the best or the ones that people thought had the best reception, you know, and to see that occur, it's just, it's just gross. It's like a representation of just like this anger in society or something. I, I don't know. And everyone I've talked to about it has said that it just made them feel feeling like they have no interest in really watching this show anymore. This, the, the Oscars mm-hmm. anymore. And I thought Chris Rock handled it like a pro. Um, he, I don't think I could have handled it as quite as well as he did. Honestly, mm-hmm. like I hope I can. I hope I could be that type of person that just says, "Oh, that occurred," and then just continue on with the show, wrap to the next segment, walk out, and not come back, and handle it in a in a de-escalating way. Um, but when I saw that occur, I just thought to myself, like, "How did this? How did we get here?" Right? And yeah. the joke that he delivered was so honestly benign, like it, compared to what comedians at the Oscars have said to other people. Oh my yeah. gosh. The things I have, I went back and rewatched some of the jokes that other hosts have, have delivered to some of the actors and they just cringe in their chair. And then later they hug and they laugh about it and that kind of stuff. And it's just part of the yeah. game. It's just part of this whole thing. But one thing D that really I took away from the whole thing is I really don't have an interest in watching the Oscars again. Like I I'm sure I will because I don't think I should boycott the Oscars uh, especially with all these wonderful filmmakers and stuff doing the things that they're doing. But like, it just, I was like, why yeah. am I watching this? Like why? Right. Like I had that, that negative, like you said, kind of reaction to it all. Well, I, I, I always watch the Oscars just cause I love movies and it's something like me and my dad, my brother, we bonded over movies a lot when we were kids. Yeah. Or, well, my dad, my dad wasn't a kid, but when my brother and I were kids, and we all watched the, the Oscars c- together. Like my whole family watched the Oscars together when we were kids. And I feel like the, the Oscar telecast back then was way better than it is now. And mm-hmm. I thought back then, and maybe I was just being a child at the time and not catching everything, but like it now feels like it's so political who wins. Um, Will Smith had a good performance for, for King Richard, but he was definitely not the best. I can name like, multiple people who I thought were better, several of whom weren't even nominated. And uh, he did, his performance was fine, but he's done much better. Like he's a very talented actor for sure. Uh, but it felt very political when he won. And then with all everything that was going on, it feels more like a, a kind of a celebration of celebrity than it is an honoring of the movies. Yes. That's a great, <clears throat> great way of putting it. I actually really feel that way as well. Yeah. Or yeah. at least the last, I should say at least the last like five to seven years. Cause I, I remember we used yeah. to watch it in college together and stuff. Um, and I think at the time the host was like Whoopi Goldberg and like, um, uh, Billy Crystal and that kind of stuff. There was mm-hmm. like song and Chris dance. Rock was a great host and Chris Rock. Yeah. He did in 2014 or something or 16 mm-hmm. or something like it. Right. So there was a lot of great stuff happening, but I remember there being a lot of song and dance and a lot of it associated with the actual film itself. And now it, it does yeah. feel like it's about the celebrity. Yeah. And, and they keep extending the red carpet. It feels like they're really trying to get to sell this and they're really worried about ratings at the same time. Like if you want ratings, if you want people to tune in and watch, put it out on a streaming platform. Yeah. Let people watch it on a streaming platform. Not like I was looking at, okay, how can I watch? I want to stream this. And it was like, oh, you have to have a like a TV service in order to watch it. Whether it's, you know, a, a cable service or you can watch on broadcast TV or you can watch through like YouTube TV or something like that where you actually have a TV thing. Their distribution channel is in the past and they need to update. Mm-hmm. The other thing is uh, that they keep trying too hard. <laughs> like the whole thing felt just thirsty. Like they were like, Oh, we, it's like when somebody's trying way too hard to make a girl like him and it just comes off creepy and, and, and like, uh, just like superficial and fake, just, just make a better show, make an entertaining show, actually honor, put some sincerity into it. And you won't feel like you need to shorten the telecast in order to do that. Like, I don't, I don't feel like they look at the Super Bowl and say to themselves, like, oh, we can sell advertising at a much higher rate than 60 minutes, which comes on afterwards. Yeah. And think to themselves, oh, we need to shorten this so we can't sell as many ads. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like the idea of like you have to shorten it is because you're not putting out a good product. If you had a good product, nobody would want to shorten it and they would want it to be longer. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah, 100% agree. And I think people tune into the Oscars to for th- for three reasons. I think one is is to see their hopefully vote and their for their not vote, but like cheer on their their favorite movie and and hope it wins and, and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Especially if there's really good movies that year, right? Like mm-hmm. ones that people just really loved. Number two is I think that a lot of people really like the glitz and glamour of it, like the dresses and the outfits and this and all the celebrities coming together under one roof. And another part of it is the entertainment in between. So the singers, the remember when um uh Hugh Jackman did it? And he oh, was yeah. like, oh my gosh, he did like a, we basically watched like a Broadway show. Like it was amazing. Yeah. Like people still talk about that. And I'm like, what happened to that? Isn't that what the arts are about? Well, I didn't feel like, ironically, I didn't feel like he was a great host, but I did feel like that was a better show overall. And one of the things is like, you get this feeling from, from Hugh Jackman that, you know, he's not a comedian. He's not going to do what Chris Rock or Billy Crystal could do up on stage in that way, but he just feels like a good human being. So you feel like you're in good hands. Yes. Yes. And I felt that way about Whoopi Goldberg when she did it. Like she's Mm -hmm. just big smiles and funny and like kind. And you're like, you're like, this feels right, you know, as as a host. What do you think that they can do? Oh, one other point before we move on. I just came out yesterday um, Mm -hmm. as of the time that we're filming, that we're recording this. It came out yesterday that Will Smith was asked to leave and he refused. He refused to leave. Mm-hmm. And then he goes up and apologizes to the Academy. And I don't think you, you can't apologize while you're also at the same time refusing to do what they're asking you to do it, within their event. That's just completely mm-hmm. disingenuous. Well, I didn't think you can say no. It's not your event, right? I, I would assume that if they say you have to leave, it's like you have to leave. Otherwise, you get escorted out in between well, the, you know, commercial <laughs> breaks or whatever they want to do, right? Well, you, you talk to anybody who works in customer service or food service or anything like that. And when, when you ask somebody to leave and they refuse, your next step is, right, well, I guess I got to call the cops and have this person physically removed. And yeah, I and then it becomes that, an incident, right? And so. Yeah. And I, I don't think that the, the that they wanted to do that. They didn't want to to heighten the drama. They wanted to de-escalate. And uh-huh. all right. So before we get on to, to what they can do to fix it, what do you think should have happened um, in the aftermath, what, how do you think the Academy should have handled it that night? That night? Um, mm-hmm. I think that, you mean in the moment? Yeah, or or for the rest of the telecast. Yeah, so I think they should have made an announcement. They should have said mm-hmm. something about what happened. They did. They just pretended like nothing happened, which I thought yeah. was like really creepy. That was the um, worst. They should have done a pause and they should have written something on the screen that said, unfortunately, we had an incident that occurred, blah, 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 and all this stuff. Uh, this person has been, you know, Will Smith has been removed from the theater in, in respect to the rest of the people who have, you know, are here tonight to celebrate their their films. We will continue on with this telecast and handle this this matter privately. Something something like that. And just did like a like a three minute pause or whatever. So the world can go, okay, we're going to reset. We're going to let Questlove and everybody get on stage and kind of like, you know, do their thing. Um, and we're going to try to move on from it just so that we don't mm-hmm. dishonor them. And then mm-hmm. I would have, I would have had him leave. Absolutely. Would have had him. listen. you've got to go like, that's it. It's over with. And if he doesn't want to leave, then I would call security and just say, Hey, you know, we're going to have to do this in a, in a uncomfortable way, which is basically have security escort you out because this is, this is needs to be discussed and this is not right. And, and at this point, Chris Rock was already gone. He had already mm-hmm. left, I believe. Mm-hmm. So I would have done something like that and, yeah. then, and I would have made an announcement about it. And the thing about it is, is hindsight's 2020. I mean, it's easy for me to say that I am sure all of them were caught off guard big time. They yeah. were like, what? This has never happened like this. So yeah. I'm sure they didn't, in the moment, they're like, what do we do? We probably don't even, you know, normally they have like a book and it tells you like procedures for everything, like yeah. for a lot of these big shows, right? There's nothing in there that says what happens if, a, you know, one of the nominees uh, attacks one of the hosts, right? Like, yeah, because they don't anticipate that happening. Now, maybe they anticipate some sort of a ruckus happening somewhere like, oh, some something happened backstage or whatever it is, but they probably didn't think about it. So giving them benefit of the doubt in that sense, I would have taken a break. I would have called a pause on this, taken a break. I would have exit, had them leave. I would have made an announcement about it and then try to move forward in respect to yeah. everyone else. Everyone else. Well, I think the, the, the bind that Will Smith put them in and one of the reasons why I think he's probably could be looking at a harsher punishment is that he refused to leave. They asked him to leave and yeah. they refused to. They put him in the position where like, well, you're going to have to physically remove me. 
which is just really, really poor taste, really poor choice on Will Smith's part. Um, and I, I think it makes sense for the Academy to say, okay, we don't want to have a whole incident where the police have to come in here sure. and do what they're going to do. And who knows what the police are going to do. Like you, I have my own concerns about how police respond to the need to deescalate situations because they're not necessarily trained to do that. But I, I think that in, in the moment that it happened, they absolutely should have had security on stage immediately. Oh yeah. Like as soon as that slap was thrown and, it, and the yelling started, they should have had a security presence on stage in order to calm everybody down. This is not going to get worse. I think that they, like you said, they, to make an announcement that this is what happened, we will not tolerate it happening again. Will Smith maybe even announced that Will Smith has, has been asked to leave and has refused to do so. Like, and have, you know, some elder statesman like a Denzel Washington or a Tom Hanks or somebody make that announcement so that it's like, hey, this is coming from, you know, a solemn place of authority. And then I would, if if Wilson's not going to leave and he's not willing to, like, to to call out the cops in order to remove him, just keep him off camera. Like, oh, when, there you go, when yeah. he wins the award, like, no, you don't get to give a speech. And you're not, you and your wife are not going to be shown on camera for the rest of this. We're going to make sure that the cameras completely avoid you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that definitely could have been a, a way to handle it. And mm-hmm. I, I look back at it now and, you know, it's easy. Like I said, it's easy to play, what do they call it? Like Monday morning quarterback or, you know, mm-hmm. um, on it, but there is other ways. And, and one of the comments that I actually made to you, which was, um, it's too bad that the hosts don't have security protection. Like I just realized, like you're yeah, hired sure. to come in and host a show, but then there, where's the security? I mean, I, I'm assuming yeah. there's security guards standing around everywhere, right? Just in case something yeah. happens, someone gets hurt, someone, you know, for whatever reason. But none of them responded, and that just might be because they just didn't know what to do. Well, if if, if a random fan had done that, oh, if it, if it wasn't Will Smith, it was just someone from the crowd. They would have been all over him. Oh, and yeah. that person would have been arrested. That person would be, uh, you know would have been prosecuted. Like even if, even if Chris Rock was like, no, I don't want to prosecute that person. They would still, he would, they would still be prosecuted. And there, there is leeway within, within the Academy for them to, to, to file a criminal complaint in order to, to have this done. And the fact that, that none of that was done just says some pretty gross things about how celebrity is handled within kind of this community. Absolutely. Yeah. But hey, let's talk a little bit about um, a few other things that night, a little more positive and stuff. Um, you had uh, sent me a note about Coda uh, becoming mm-hmm. the first movie distributed by a streaming service to win Best Picture Oscar. That's pretty exciting, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, app, it, was, it was an Apple film, which, well, I should say it was distributed by Apple. On mm-hmm. Apple was it Apple Plus? Is that the name of their service? <laughs> I always mix it up with Apple TV. See, now you just threw me off. Yeah, it's, it's Apple Plus. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I was like, is that Apple Plus? Is that Disney Plus? And then they have Apple TV, which gets confusing. Anyway, so they uh, they did not make the film. They distributed it. Mm-hmm. So they they I think they bought it based off of a trailer that they saw before anybody else could get to it. Well, they they, uh, they acquired the rights for it for about $25 million from mm-hmm. the when it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. So they saw I, it at Sundance and then... I think I read that they they bought it before it was actually shown at Sundance because they bought it based on not having seen the full movie yet. Oh, interesting. I don't and know. They I bought mean, it at Sundance, but I think it ha- it technically happened before it premiered. Oh, they, interesting. I, yeah, I was I just they looking managed at what, to avoid a bidding war. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's smart because I I actually the what I re- heard was from Hollywood Reporter and they had mentioned that it was acquired the rights to Coda after reported a twenty five million dollars after the film premiered at the twenty one. Mm-hmm. 2021 Sundance Film Festival. That's what I read. And so that's mm. interesting. But that makes a lot of sense, though. You know, there's whispers about what's what's going to be hot and what's not, you know what I mean, at Sundance. So mm-hmm. it wouldn't surprise me at all if they optioned it prior to it even showing. Yeah, I mean, they they have the money. They can tell that it was going to be a good movie. They um, they believe in they believed in the cast. They believed in what they saw. So they got on it. And to be honest, $25 million for a movie like this is cheap. Super cheap. I, yeah. When I heard that, I was like, "Wow, that that is very cheap." <laughs> yeah, so it's it was it paid it was a gamble that paid off pretty well for them. To me, it's I don't know that I've maybe Mudbound was produced by, and Roma. No, Roma was also purchased, but 
I haven't seen a streaming service movie yet, a movie that's gone straight to streaming, that I would say is, okay, that deserved to be an Oscar winner, at least not that I can think of. But we are seeing now films that were distributed by streaming services starting to to get the respect within the the industry, which is is really what this award should be about. It should be about what is the best film, not like the the what is the best film to hit theaters. So mm-hmm. that kind of prejudice is probably best left behind. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is kind of a sign of that because there was there were a lot of when Roma was nominated, there were a lot of you know old old Hollywood filmmakers who were in up in arms about the fact that it was made and distributed over a streaming service. There's a yeah. lot of just bias and stigma f- about things shown on a TV. Yeah, well, you know, th- things have changed, and the reality is is that with streaming services uh, available and having like hundreds of millions of people on those services, um, it's only fair that however you choose to distribute it if it's a great film it should have the option to to mm-hmm. win an award in my opinion um it's just the way the world's moving you know as walt disney used to always say right you always tell me he got one foot in the past one foot in the future or something like that it's mm-hmm. like this is the future and this is where it's going and and i i like it for a different reason so i think because all these streaming services exist now and their job is to just have a ton of content that's available for a lot of different people in a lot of different areas of the world what it ends up doing is it ends up ramping up the amount of creative that occurs because mm-hmm. there's so many shows and so many movies and so many shorts that are being created now that a mm-hmm. lot of actors are getting a lot of work and I read about yeah. this, like there's just a ton of work and you could be a working actor, meaning you don't have to be in an Academy Award uh, nominated movie or or even a series that everyone knows about. You can have mm-hmm. a good living just doing stuff that's only available on streaming on the, I don't know, what is there, 12, 14 streaming services now? It's like 12,000 maybe. Well, no, but I mean like, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. that's, that's true. But I'm saying like in general that like people, the, the, the more popular ones that people tend to do, yeah. if you just looked at those and then looked at the number of films and shows that are being produced, they're opening up new recording studios and film studios in LA, Denver, and lots of other places because they can't keep up with the demand right now. Yeah, and if you look up the, uh, there are numbers out there I've seen where you can look up the number of produced movies by year, and it has exploded since the streaming services come on. It's like tripled since like bef- since the 2010 or something before streaming services were really a thing. Yeah. So it's it's I, I think I think it's good for cinema. I know a lot of like purists would be like that's ridiculous, but it is, and I think there are some some movies that are definitely better suited for watching at home than they are in the theater. I think that like you take a small intimate uh horror movie for example, um it's scarier when you're at home. Like you're watching The Ring for the first time. I remember when I watched The Ring for the first time. I was sitting at home. I was alone. It was late at night and right after they had the, you know, 7 days moment my brother calls me on the phone. <laughs> so I'm and sitting there like, and I'm not? watching the phone <laughs> ring in seven days. I'm like, oh crap, she's going to die. And then my phone rings. Like it was, it was one of those movie moments that sticks with me forever. And it's beca- one of the reasons why is because I was at home. And if you go watch a movie theater or a horror, a horror film in the movie theater, like there's a lot of laughing and screaming and all kinds of stuff, which has its own experience, but it's not that like immersive, scary feeling that you can actually get from watching it at home. You know, I was thinking example. about this the other day because you and I were talking about how uh, they're trying to push, you know, these films into VR and mm-hmm. how wearing the headset kind of gets, you know, cumbersome and sweaty mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff over time. And they're lightening these headsets. And I was thinking like, I think like horror films would be super freaky on those things. Oh, man. Because horror, it's horror. Like- you, you play any of the horror games like Resident Evil and it's it's like it's perfect for it. Yeah. It is perfect for it. It's like it's like dialed in. And that and that's something actually that kind of ties into the next thing that we were going to talk about. And that's why I wanted to to get your take on it. Um, is that you had sent me a note and you said nature is healing. <laughs> and you said that because the GPU prices are coming back down to earth. We are at a point now. I mean, let's just take a moment and appreciate this, right? Or just recognize it, not, not necessarily appreciate it is that when we were kids, none of this really existed and it was all starting to get built. We're at a point Mm -hmm. right now where cars, film devices, data center, like you name it, 
requires these GPUs and even the the mm-hmm. headsets that we're talking about, right, to watch these movies and everything, to the point where if price fluctuations occur, the whole entire market tends to, tends to get shooken up, right? So mm-hmm. when you sent this over to me, I was like, wow, are we here? Have we arrived to the point where tech products are basically like fundamentally changing like the economics of so many businesses? And and, and it and we have. And so tell us a little bit about these GPU prices and like why they're coming back back to earth. Well, I mean, they've been trying to increase production for quite a while. It was limited by the amount of fabrication facilities that could produce the silicon for quite a while. I'm like um, the, or not even the silicon, it's the the um, uh, the chips themselves, the semiconductors. So there were just a few companies that can do it. I think there was um, Samsung had a facility, and there was another one in Taiwan that was uh, producing things. And they have been trying for a while to op it, but it takes a few years for these facilities to get made and, and come up online uh they're very difficult to produce so part of it is the fact that uh that the supply is increasing because manufacturing new manufacturing facilities have come online there's been uh the supply chain uh constraints that we ran into partially because of covid partially because of tariffs partially because of other things has or even labor labor shortages has been alleviated so things are moving around better the uh the uh, proof of work mining uh, cryptocurrency impact is hopefully kind of reducing dramatically. So this is mostly driven by Ethereum, which uh, like Bitcoin mining mostly moved over to ASICs, so it's like purpose-built machines specifically for for um, for mining. Okay, but Ethereum mining has been more dependent upon GPU-based machines for a while, and they have plans within the next few months. To switch from proof of work, which is what we think of historically when it comes to uh, mining, which is the very energy intensive process, uh, and switching over to um, the proof of stake, uh, which has its own issues. But one of the advantages is it's not uh, as dependent upon GPUs and it doesn't use up anywhere near the same amount of energy that it does. And the, one of the other major factors is Intel is now releasing new GPUs. Um, so that is causing um, just a new competitor within the market could help to reduce prices because they're now competing with each other a bit more. Yeah. So this is kind of driving the prices down. This is making things more available. And it's actually not just affecting the GPU market because as these all of these factors also help just chips in general. Uh, and these are chips that can go into cars or like your smart fridge. Uh, they're needed for data centers or needed for power plants. Just, just like, you know, as what was the old saying, software is eating the world. But in order for software to do that, you need these, uh, these chips in all of the different products. And for the last couple of years, it's been heavily constrained. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I, I keep thinking about this because, We're at the point now where like, let's say you're a 16 year old kid and you'd like to have a really awesome gaming machine. What does it cost you to have one of those gaming machines right now? Like a really awesome one? Yeah. Like if you're, you're 16, you want to, you want to game with everybody and you want to keep up with them. And you know, these GPUs are a big part of that. What does it cost you out the door? Would you say, cause you know, I know you've done this and you've also built your own to, to, to get one of those machines these days. Well, if you wanted something that was, you know, close to the top of the line, then, you know, you're looking at, you know, a few hundred bucks for the processor, maybe close to a grand, depending on what kind of processor you're getting. And then you need the motherboard, you know, a couple hundred bucks and memory, and then you, uh, hard drives now. I don't know. They have these, uh, the new hard drives. I don't know if you've built a machine recently, but I haven't built one in a while. It's been a long time. I actually been thinking about doing it just because I think it'd be fun. Yeah. So the new hard drives, they're they're they look like flash drives. They're like little cards that go into your machine, and they're you can get like terabyte, two terabytes. They're uh, non volatile memory, so it's NVMe. And they're super fast. Um, so they're if you imagine, you know, a 3.5 mechanical drive, these things are, are just minuscule by comparison. But yeah. That'll cost you, you know, a hundred, couple hundred bucks uh, for a terabyte or two. Um, and then the drive, if you're getting like a 3090, like an RTX 3090, that's probably a couple grand right now. Oh, so that's, okay. yeah, that's, and then you've got to get monitors and uh, depending on the nature of the monitor you're going to get, and that could be, 
you know, a thousand dollars. Or if you're going to go Apple, that's like sixteen hundred dollars. So you can get something that's just as good for five hundred bucks less. Yeah. Um, then you have, you know, if you're going to get like a, a a really nice custom keyboard, that could be anywhere from a couple hundred bucks to like thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. So you're so you're talking like realistically, a sixteen year old kid wanting to have a good machine is going to need like five Gs. Well, if you're going to have a top of the line machine, yeah. it's probably around five Gs. If you want a good machine, you can probably get away with maybe um, 1500, 2000. You could probably go cheaper. Honestly, you can yeah. have people massively overestimate what it's needed to, to run the games that are out there. I mean, you could probably build a, you know, if you already have a monitor and keyboard and stuff, then you can probably build like a, a machine tower for like five to 600 bucks that would actually be able to play every game on the market right now. But when we talk about price on these types of machines, for example, are we looking at the biggest cost is these GPUs? So when these GPU prices start to like cave and go back down to earth, it becomes more accessible, right? To the average person who's just looking to mm-hmm. to buy a nice machine, right? Because I because what, what I've heard is is that that the GPUs were being, you know, obviously picked up by everyone who was doing mining and stuff like that. Now, when you're making an investment into something because you think you're gonna make money on it, that's a lot different than just saying, like, oh, I want to build a great machine so I can play games. Right. Yeah. And so those people have basically been kind of cut out of the market for like two years. So yeah. do you think that these prices coming back down at this point are gonna allow them to re-enter the market? And we're gonna see kind of an uptick in sales for like gaming machines and, 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 and things like that? Uh, well, ultimately the, the upsell is, well, I mean, most people aren't going to buy a a pre-built unless it's a laptop. I mean, a lot of people do, uh, there's companies who build, who make pre-built like HP and, and, uh, Alienware and stuff. They do fine. Uh, but a lot of the more serious gamers will build it themselves. They'll spec it out themselves. Um, and it's more like, I guess, yeah, I would think so. But I, I think the biggest factor is that it's now just available. Like you could not physically buy some of these cards in the middle of the pandemic. Like yeah. it didn't matter how much money you were willing to pay for it. Sometimes it just couldn't find one for sale at all. Yeah. Remember when so, I when I told you that one of the family members that I know had uh had like twelve of them sitting at their house because they had purchased them like r- right before the pandemic? Yeah. And, and and I ch- sent a picture to you and you looked at it and you're like, dude, those, <laughs> those things are nearly impossible to get. And would you'd make a fortune off of those if you just didn't want to keep them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that, absolutely that was, that was part of that. That was part of that yeah. time. So no, this is, this is all good news. And, and with the self-driving cars, like really getting into using, um, you know, computer vision and things like that and needing these chips mm-hmm. and everything. I mean, and also I heard the data, um, Intel and some of the other companies are starting to build facilities in the United States, manufacturing yes. facilities in the United States. That is super cool. I'm excited to see that again. I know that um, that didn't happen for a long time. And now that the investments are being made here in the US, it's like we got jobs, chips are being made locally. Like mm-hmm. this is fantastic. I think I, I'm looking forward to more of that happening. Yeah. So great. Um, all right. So let's talk about the last topic here, which I was actually not aware of until you'd sent me links to it. And uh, and then I did some digging and some research on it. But uh, so Bungie is suing over fake DMCA takedowns. So do you want to explain like what a DA, uh, DMCA takedown is? I'm sure people were familiar once you explain it. Um, and let's yeah. talk about actually what happened here and whether or not this will get rectified. So DMCA takedown, I forget what DMCA actually stands for, but it's uh, basically whenever the the whole the owner of an IP uh, of IP for anything, whether it's music or video or a game or anything like that, um, has their material used in usually some form of like social media, um, like YouTube or Twitch or something like that. So DMCA, just as a pause, there was from remember when Congress passed the uh the dmca act it's digital millennium copyright act yeah the millennium thing always messes with (laughs) this is not to do with the millennium but anyway uh it's we already we already joked about how congress likes to name their their self-aggrandized moderately well-written legislation basically what it is is uh if somebody owns uh the ip and somebody on youtube or twitch or somewhere else uses that song or video or whatever it is without permission uh and and it doesn't fall within the fair use act which has kind of become 
kind of become irrelevant in practice. I don't even really get the Fair Use Act because I talked to a lawyer about this Mm -hmm. and they said the Fair Use Act is kind of like, if I don't, if I, if I don't think that you did anything wrong, you'll be left alone. But if I think you're encroaching on my business, then I can slap your hand. It's kind of a weird law. Well, I, I, actually, I don't even know if it's a if it was an act or a law. I think it might just be a, a, a principle. But uh, it's essentially if somebody is using using the content in order to like do a criticism of it or something along those lines, there and they're not just wholesale stealing it, then it's fair use. Like if if uh, you're reviewing a song or a movie and you're you play a bit of it in order to illustrate your point, then uh, you know in in your criticism of it then that's considered fair use, but it's everybody's aired very hard on the uh, kind of towards the DMCA rather than fair use that it's kind of, it's kind of become irrelevant. It shouldn't be, but it kind of has been, but getting into what has actually happened. I didn't even know this until I saw this news story break. I knew that, that DMCAs have been an issue for creators on YouTube because just about everything gets a strike. Um, You can pay uh, three seconds of a song and just get stricken. Uh, and even I think Kevin Smith and some other creators were just, couldn't show clips of their own movies because they got taken down. But what turns out could be a huge factor in this is that YouTube uh, has a flaw in their enforcement procedure where anyone can issue a DMCA strike and not just the right holders, which uh, according to, I believe you read the, the actual official policy. And mm-hmm. um, I think within the law also, the only person who can, who can make a, a DMCA complaint is the person who owns the rights. Yes. Well, so, I mean, that's, that's what the law, the law originally said. And then I started thinking mm-hmm. to myself how law, how laws actually work. And then I thought to myself, well, in, in reality, uh, Complaints can be filed by anyone, but the person, the complaint doesn't become real unless it's filed by the actual person who, who owns the rights to that. Well, that's like a legal action at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So only uh, according to the letter of the law, if you're enforcing DMCA through the court system, then you have to be the rights owner. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I think YouTube and a lot of other people have, I, don't, I think, I don't know if this is written in their DMCA policy, but it would make sense for them to say, okay, you have to be the rights owner in order to do this. Um, but they haven't enforced it in that way. And it's become kind of like, it seems like it's become a way for, for people to just troll anybody who's producing content. Like uh, like swatting of just like all right, well I'm gonna DMCA strike you and uh, people have gotten DMCA strikes for and they didn't even do anything mm-hmm. um, and then they didn't even produce use anybody else's content or they were using you know uh, content that they had the rights to or or contents that they paid money in order to license and that's exactly what happened to Bungie. Bungie was showing their own content around uh, around Destiny and I think Destiny too. And they got a strike and I think they got taken down because somebody out there was, was posing as the rights holder and submitted a DMCA claim, which is treated as anonymous to anybody other than Google. Uh, so Bungie's content got taken down. So now Bungie is responding by suing the unknown individuals mm-hmm. um, who, because they've made inappropriate use of their IP, which is, factual they the person exercised uh use of rights on the ip that they did not have Mm, Um, i see where this kind of gets interesting is Bungie doesn't know who these people are uh in in order to sue them um which could force google to reveal to reveal who these people are as part of a subpoena or something like that and i imagine google could look at this and say this the way in which we are doing this is causing problems and it's been causing problems for creators for a long time but um you know google doesn't seem to take the necessary action to keep their creators um, as happy as they should be i mean they're obviously you're not going to give them everything but the way in which dmca has been enforced has been somewhat lackluster and it could absolutely use uh some improvement and hopefully this leads to that 
Yeah, this kind of reminds me of um, when you start to automate things mm -hmm. where there's all these gray areas, right? And people start to take advantage of the fact that the automated system acts in a certain way. One of the things I've noted, noticed anecdotally, and I, I mentioned this actually, actually to you a year ago, and I did ask uh, this question to one of the YouTube um, kind of influencers that we have talked to about. Mm -hmm. As I said, I've noticed over the last couple of years that a lot of the content on Instagram and YouTube is using music from like famous musicians. Mm -hmm. But none of those people have the rights that I know of from those people in order to to use it, to use the music. And I asked uh, one of the YouTube influencers that we know about that. And he said, eh, you kind of just use it. And if they say, don't do this, then you kind of just take it off. That actually didn't happen about three or four years ago. I, I feel like things have loosened up. And one of the things that I noticed also on Instagram in particular is that when music is being played by, let's say, ACDC on a cool, like, surfing video or something like that, it actually calls out who it is. It says ACDC and the name of the song and, and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff in there. I wonder if with all these different things like the DMCA takedowns and, you know, fair use act and all that, it's all starting to kind of like blend in a weird way because a lot of the actions that are taken from these larger companies like YouTube and stuff like that is through algorithms and automation. Mm -hmm. And so they might have to take a step back and say, whoa, wait a minute, it's getting a little out of control here. We want to, you know, make sure that all the creators get the creative credit or whatever that they deserve for what they're producing. Um, if you allow for other people to use, let's say, use your music or use uh, little video clips from your game and that kind of stuff, then you have to say where it came from and link back to them. Otherwise... Mm -hmm you have to pay them for the rights to do it or something like that. I think this is going to create reform. I think there's going to be something that happens where this all gets cleared up. Um, I, well, I, I, it I, just feels that way. Yeah, I, I, I definitely hope so. And it, it basically takes something like this where somebody who has money and says, hey, the, the system isn't working how it should be. Uh, we're going to do something about it because for you know the users or even the creators in order to do that just doesn't get it done. So it will take somebody like, like uh, EA or Disney or – um, or Bungie or Microsoft to step in and say, hey, this is not the right implementation in order to get it done. Absolutely. What's interesting here that I think this this kind of kind of brings to light um, a couple of things is there's problems with the, with the way in which IP is implemented. And I've talked before about, hey, you know what? It makes more sense to not require somebody's express permission to use their IP just to make at least IP over a certain age, for, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe because now you know, copyrights never expire anymore. Thanks to the Mickey mouse act. Um, in the, before that it was, you know, after a certain age, it becomes part of the public domain and yep. that kind of went away, but something like that should be, I think an intermediate ground where like over, let's say over a few years old, for example, it's free to, it's, uh, anybody can use it, but you have to pay like a, you know, a minimum royalty, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, like you can use it. You don't have to get permission, but you have to pay a minimum royalty to this person in order to use it. Yeah. And they can um, automate that so that it it just says uh, charge $2 to this mm -hmm. thing, click, click, click. And it's over with, right? They can make yeah. that simple. Yeah. They can make it pretty simple. And it maybe it needs to be like a, some proportion of their earnings, right? I mean, if, and if it's not commercialized, then maybe there is some alternative thing like, okay, you got to pay 25 bucks or something like this to have like a, a clip from... Let's say GI Jane. For oh, no jeez! <laughs> Put that in your video thing and talking about whatever is going on in the news. Uh, there's uh, a variety of of ways that we can handle this to improve the IP enforcement rules. Yeah. The other thing that this points out to me is uh, AI, because that's how these algorithms are basically AI. They're using machine learning in order to to do these kind of automated actions. When people, the this is the kind of thing that people, um, that is the main point of concern when it comes to implementing AI. It is not the idea that the machines are going to decide to take over the world because the reality is they have no desire to, right? Machines don't have desire. Um, maybe, maybe someday in the far flung future, then machines will actually have desire, but they don't. They have no motivation. 
the danger for the for uh, the foreseeable future is just poorly implemented AI that's not doing things right, and then they never get corrected. So they start doing things like this, where they're taking down things for no reason or incorrectly, and it never gets corrected. Let me tell you, this is the tip of the iceberg when it yeah. comes to this stuff. And especially as we're starting to use um, AI in order to handle some of our issues. When you have millions and millions and millions of people on a platform, you cannot have humans handle all of that information, right? Mm-hmm. Can, they can't enforce everything. They can't fix everything that way. You have to have automated systems in place in order to do that. So I think we are going to run up to a lot of these run across a lot of these issues. And, and ultimately, I think it's going to be like researchers and things like that that are figuring out ways to handle this appropriately. But mm-hmm. one thing I wanted to bring up that I heard, um, so I was listening to Victory, the podcast the other day, and they were talking about a company that um, basically uses machine learning to learn your voice. Okay. Let's say it's a podcast, right? So we train it on D's voice. Then when I want to promote this podcast in like another country, it will play the same podcast in their native language with your voice, right? And one of the things that they brought up on this that I thought was really interesting is that you were talking about um, IP and how long it lasts and stuff. They said, okay, let's play this out a couple decades, right? So we're now using this in all of these different countries in order to play this podcast that is the uh, the same one, but different language. Then over time, they go, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just have D produce his own podcast, but it's not D. It's the algorithm does the podcast, right? They just maybe put in some content. And then over time, D's passes away and he's no longer around. What happens when we start using your voice that the system has learned really well in order to produce content in the future that is not from your brain, but just from things that we want you to say because people have loved your podcast voice? Who owns the rights to that? How does that how, do, how does that unfold as we move down down the line to heirs and other people when those aren't really your thoughts anymore? Those are just, it's just your voice. The IP basically is D's voice. Well, right? I mean, does anybody need to own that? I don't see why or any reason why anybody needs to own that. Well, that's that was the question, right? Does it become just public domain of like, hey, it's D's voice. Anyone can use it. They can make videos out of it. They can have uh, their own podcast channel where D is reading off all of their content. Um, yeah. and then the assumption is, is that that's D who's saying those things, or do we know as humans like, oh, that's just the voice that we are borrowing because we like the sound of that voice, right? It gets really weird real fast. Well, I think that it, well, I, I don't think this should be something that is available until you know, at least a few years after someone has passed away. Yeah. Uh, so there's no, there's no question whether or not this, these are the things this person is actually saying. And then it has to be called out. Like this is like legal um, where the law legislation should be involved. I don't think there's uh, legislation to solve every problem, uh-huh. but this is one where it says, all right, if you're using somebody's voice, like James Earl Jones um, yep. Yep. or Orson Welles, like I'm, you know, who's been dead for quite some time now and he had an iconic voice and you want to use his voice or John Houston, some of these people who've, you know, narrated some of our favorite things when we were kids uh, and you want to use their voice, label it as, okay, well, this is your simulated voice. So then nobody thinks that it is. And then you just use it. I don't know why the, an heir would need to make money off of that or why they should deserve to. Yeah. Um, just make it kind of like within this, don't pretend like this is actually Orson Welles saying this thing about like your, your resort built in 2020. Yep. Uh, just, I, I don't know, just make it available. It's, it, it's a it combination of sound. The complexity of IP. As you were talking about IP, sure. I just keep thinking like all these rabbit holes that a lot of, you know, uh, philosophers and stuff go down. Of yeah. like, are we getting to a point where it's like, how do like IP can be out of control? Cause you've talked about this before where you're like, there's so yeah. many like levers that are being pulled in order to control IP that it's almost getting to the point where it's like, you can't even produce things anymore because it's like, you get the permission from so many different people. The creativity starts to suffer, right? Well, yeah, I think, I'm, I don't think IP has to be that complicated. I yeah. think we've made it complicated because everybody's trying to make as much money as they possibly can off of IP, some of which they didn't even do any work to create themselves. Yep. So, yeah. And part of that is, you know, goes back to the, the reality that in our, our current society, we've, 
we've made it very, very difficult for people to make money off of their actual work at any level. And it's become all about, you know, IP economy, where you do the work once and then you send it out in the world in order to make you money um, passively, which I think makes it sense to a certain extent, but we've obsessed over it way too much. Yeah, I think the one to many model is brilliant for scaling and, and all that kind of stuff. I get it. But like, it's really interesting to think that it's, is it possible that, you know, 40 years from now, I'll be able to host a, host a podcast with Chris Wallace, or like, I think that was the, the example they used on uh, victory, the podcast, or like, you know, Orson Welles or like, you know what I mean? Because you're like, Oh, I, I'd like to buy the rights to, to the voice for one hour a week for a podcast and, mm-hmm. and then write the content or something. Right. It's like, there's like, I can't even comprehend like how the, this can unfold because I haven't seen all the permutations of how this stuff is used, but we're getting to the point where it, it's, it's, it's complicated to create things uh, that include other great work unless mm-hmm. you are, unless you have like, you know, those people and you're engaged with those people to say like, Hey, by the way, uh, I'm going to use your music for this or do this for that. Because I, I was listening to actually a producer. I know this is a little, little off base a little bit, but he was talking about how like, he wanted to create a, um, a pilot or a trailer for an idea that he had, but he didn't have permission to even use the music that he thought would help sell the idea for the trailer that he thought was amazing. So they had to use some other music and it was just kind of a bummer because they weren't actually selling that music. They were just hoping to use that music in order to kind of like create a reaction or an excitement around an idea that they were trying to sell. And he said it gets really complicated real fast, especially in Hollywood. Yeah, and it shouldn't have to be, right? It should just be, okay, well, let's have some automated system, kind of like Wikicommerce or something like that. I'm not commercializing this. I'm using this for like a sales pitch or something like that. I'll pay the 20 bucks. I can go to whatever. Uh-huh. Um, and then, I, I mean, imagine, you know, um, imagine if this had always been the way it was. I mean, this is just creating tremendous inefficiency of getting anything done. Yeah. But imagine that this was always the way it was. And like, if you were, um, if you were making, you know, West Side Story, let's say, or the tragedy of Macbeth, and you have to go track down <laughs> uh, Shakespeare's descendants hundreds of years after he died in order to give them their cut. Exactly, like they had anything to do with with the content being made. Yeah. So it's 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 a bit ridiculous. Like I, I think that okay, when when somebody who has made millions of dollars, let's you know uh, Will Smith, for example. Uh, when he passes away sometime in, in hopefully the far future, cause I have always been, I've, I've been a long time fan of Will Smith going back to the eighties and parents just don't understand and nightmare in my street. And I think I can knock out Mike Tyson before he even had the fresh print show. It's one of the reasons why this is such a disappointing and depressing thing for me. Yeah. But when he does pass away, like, his his children are going to inherit millions of dollars. They're going to be fine. I don't think that they nec- it serves anybody other than just their desire not to have to work ever that they continue to make royalties off of stuff that Will Smith made 30 years ago. Yeah. Like well, I mean, that's like the Michael Jackson stuff. That's ridiculous. Right? Like, yeah. Like they're still, you know, profiting as much as they can, obviously, um, you know, off of the estates and things like that. But I also heard that they're, you know, trying to figure out this whole hologram stuff, you know, it's like if you produce a hologram and then you put on a show with the hologram and people buy tickets to go and all that kind of stuff, like who gets the the profits to all this and, you know, it, it gets... Well, it's very simple. It should go to the people who create the hologram. It's, yeah, see, it is. It see, doesn't see, need to go to Michael Jackson's kids. Like why, what have they done to, to earn this? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated one. I mean, they see it as like, oh, this is, you know, beyond just basic stuff this is like michael jackson this is the estate this is the 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 rights ownership and and ultimately like this all comes down to how we, we've laughed about this it all comes mm-hmm. down to how much you're willing to invest in the lawyers because even, even yeah, with the patents that we have and stuff ultimately if you don't have lawyers that are doing all the work for you in order to like yeah. protect it and write the you know the patents and all this kind of stuff you just can't succeed the way that others do in that space. And it gets real expensive real fast. And ultimately the lawyers are the ones that make the most on this. Well, 
it's the it's the heirs that make the most off of it ultimately. Well, yeah, because they don't do it. They don't they don't do much to get it or anything at all. Yeah, right? they're they're already just kind of like hiring lawyers to go do. I mean, they're not even doing the legal work themselves. They're hiring people to do it. They did nothing to earn this. Yeah, like and they're already fine. Like, I, it, it's tying up the court systems. It's making things more difficult for everybody. It's it's a ridiculous thing in order to ensure that people who are already multimillionaires for doing nothing be, get a little bit more money. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. it's it should be it, it really needs to be reformed because it's way too much yeah it's pretty it's pretty co- it's pretty big and complicated at this point you know what i mean to the point where like you said you have to have lawyers and troves of lawyers in order to protect you and to keep all yeah. your stuff in line but this was an interesting conversation today i mean like we really covered a, three completely different topics but uh but it was fun d uh thanks for uh for picking those topics this week i think our listeners will appreciate it um so thanks everyone for listening and taking the time today to jump in and hear our thoughts on this stuff. Um, we'll be posting links to many of the sources that we referenced on Twitter. So you can find us and follow us at Twitter, the X podcast one, that's the X podcast and the number one after that. If you like this podcast, found it interesting or informative, it helps us a great deal if you subscribe or leave a review on whatever platform you use. So thanks everyone. And we will see you all next week. <laughs>